It's only 200 days, 28 weeks, until Wisconsin elects a governor. I can't believe it's coming so soon. Yeah, but we're talking about it, front page stories in the newspaper, and more importantly, podcasting about it. Welcome to Center Stage with Milford and Hands. Hi there, I'm uh, Phil Hands. I'm the editorial cartoonist at the Wisconsin State Journal. And I'm Scott Milford, the editorial page editor for the Wisconsin State Journal. We also are half of the Wisconsin State Journal editorial board. The better looking half. <laughs> My mom says I'm very good looking. <laughs> So Center Stage, this isn't a uh, podcast about theater. This is political talk from the sensible center of Wisconsin politics. Yes, here at Center Stage, we offer locally sourced artisanal journalism. (laughs) So let's start talking about the race for governor. It actually is going to be here before we know it. And the big question, let's start with, is Scott Walker beatable? The answer is yes, but let's have you decide first, Phil. Well, I think there is going to be a blue wave. And I think I think the election has a lot to do with the, the guy in the White House right now that people are seem very unhappy with. So I think that makes Scott Walker more vulnerable than otherwise he would be. Um, but Scott Walker has a knack for winning elections. He's won a lot of them. Uh, in his short tenure, or in his eight years as governor. He's won three elections. He defeated a recall. Um, He always seems to get just enough votes to be governor. So uh, while he's vulnerable, I don't think it's uh, it's necessarily a foregone conclusion he's going to lose this election. Yeah, I think there's one big reason why Scott Walker is vulnerable, and it's Donald Trump. In a normal election cycle, Governor Walker is an incumbent governor. He's got a strong economy. He's popular with his party, very popular. And I'm pulling a sheet up here with a statistic from the University of Minnesota. 20 of the 24 governors who have sought a third term since 1970 were victorious. Incumbents almost always win, especially when it's a strong economy. But the big but is Donald Trump, who's not popular. The latest Marquette uh, Law School poll showed that Donald Trump has a 43% approval rating. That's actually up from That's where it used to be. Expected. <laughs> from where it used to be in Wisconsin, but 50% of people disapprove of Donald Trump. And to some degree, that probably crosses over and hurts Governor Walker, who's from the same party. Governor Walker's basically been in tune with uh, Trump. He hasn't really criticized him at all, other than on Uh, The free trade issue, he sort of said, well, I disagree with him on that, and I'm going to stick my head out on that. But generally, he's walked a fine line there of keeping the establishment Republicans behind him and not upsetting the Trump Republicans. He's at uh, Walker, according to the Marquette poll from just a few weeks ago, 47 percent approve of Governor Walker, 47 percent disapprove. Those percent approval ratings seem pretty normal for Scott Walker. He always seems to his, his approved numbers go down or they, 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 mud, they muddle in the mid 40s. He's even been down to the 30s in the past. But when it's time for an election, he seems to get to 50 percent or just a, just enough votes to win. Um, and that's sort of been his game plan, I think, for forever. He's not interested in building bridges to a lot of moderate and centrist voters. He wants to get just enough voters to win that election. And that's really all he cares about. The other thing he's done very well is he's ramped up his travel across the state. He's been going to dozens and dozens of schools talking about his historic increase in uh, – K-12 funding. He doesn't mention that there was a historic cut in the past. As much as money matters and what you do in office, when you travel the state like that endlessly, it does help. Once you've met the governor face to face, it's harder to dislike him so viscerally. He comes across as very reasonable when he's speaking. He He has a very civil tone. Sort of an anti-Trump, as it were. He's actually, yes, uh, precisely the opposite of the tone, in tone. But he's going to be going against a Democrat. And right now there are nine candidates. Count them nine. (laughs) Main candidates. Main candidates. In total, I believe it's something like 16. But today on Center Stage, we're going to talk about the main nine candidates 
who hope to run against Walker this fall. They're facing off in a primary. When's that primary, Scott? That primary is August 14th, and that, by the way, is 116 days from when this podcast drops on Friday and 16 weeks from today. The only uh, asterisk or caveat I would like to put on that is that our cartoonist did the math on those numbers, so... <laughs> we could be in serious trouble. <laughs> yeah. Although you were pretty good at math, right? I'm not too bad at math for a cartoonist. Yeah. So let's let's run down the Democratic candidates here. Now, we thought we're going to do these in alphabetical order. We, d- we considered doing them in order of who's the most impressive and who is, you know, who's got the best shot of winning. But with nine candidates, it's really hard to tell how this is all going to shake out in the end. Indeed, and that's what the voters are telling us, too. 44% of likely voters in the Democratic primary for governor said they don't know enough about the candidates to say who they would support. That's almost half of Democratic voters. Yes. And when they did ask who they knew about, the top candidate was Tony Evers. He's the head of the Department of Public Instruction for Wisconsin. But he was at just 18 percent. It fell quickly from there to 9 percent for Paul Soglin, mayor the red of mayor. Ma- the red mayor from Madison. Mayor for life is what we call him here. And uh, then in third place came Matt Flynn at 7 percent. I think that's partly because there was a third string quarterback for the Packers named Matt Flynn, who kind of became a little bit of a folk hero because he did well when he would be put in difficult he was, situations. He was a second string quarterback, Scott. <laughs> Second string? And was he actually, the whole time? I believe he actually holds the record for number of passing yards in a single game for the Packers because there was some game at the end of the season where Rodgers was hurt and Matt Flynn threw for a ton of yards against the Detroit Lions. Well, we'll have uh, Jason Wilde, our beat reporter, fact check that uh, <laughs> later. Uh, in any case, Matt Flynn, who is not a football player, he's a former Navy man who uh, was the head of the Democratic Party a long time ago, he is running, and he is in third place. But let's start at the top of our list. Uh, Tony Evers, first of all, he's the best known. He's run statewide for multiple campaigns for DPI secretary. He's three times won, and he, before that he ran and, and lost. So he's been around this state a lot. One of the things he has stressed during this Democratic primary is that he served as a school in school districts, you know, first as a teacher, then as a principal, then as a superintendent in some rural districts, Oakfield and I believe Toma and some others. He also has won his elections pretty handedly, the ones that he's won. He actually had the honor of running in the first election after Donald Trump had won. And he, as, as a perceived Democrat, he destroyed his, his Republican competition, I think mostly because a lot of Democrats were so upset about that 2016 election. I think when most people think of Tony Evers, they think of this sort of positive guy who's in charge of our schools. The one Democratic primary event that I watched was the debate, if you could call it that, at La Follette High School a while back. A debate with nine people. <laughs> yeah, it was it was speed dating, kind of. And uh, Evers, he is sticking out, I think, as the person who's not railing against Walker. Well, I, I think he's not going to be a fighter. You know, some Democrats want somebody who's going to fight yeah. against Walker and be their fighter. But I don't think that's Tony Evers. But that might work in this election when people are mad at Donald Trump and upset about sort of the caustic tone. He is sort of, you know, Tony Evers has a rational live and let live sort of a mentality and he's very easygoing and respectful and considerate and that's worked for a lot of democratic candidates so far um, in special elections in wisconsin and throughout the country yeah and if voters are looking for something that's not donald trump who's not uh, rude and in your face and will say anything he would be the opposite of that similar in a way, to Scott Walker along yeah. those lines in style. He would sort of match Walker's style of campaigning. Yeah, I, I do. Th- I mean, I always say that Tony Evers is like, a, he seems like a really nice old man. I'd love him to be my grandfather. I'm not <laughs> sure he's going to be the kind of fighter that d- the Democratic, the people that vote in the Democratic primary, primary, they might want somebody who's going to stick it to Scott Walker. And if they're looking for that, Tony Evers is not the guy. Yeah, and the question is, can Tony Evers get through a primary, a very crowded primary, without being the fighter, and then maybe be better off than the fighter in the general election where he has to appeal to a broader electorate? Mm -hmm. Let's keep moving down the line here to Matt Flynn, 
not the Green Bay Packers. Although he has a great helmet full of hair. <laughs> he does have a he does have great hair. He has like the thickest hair since Michael Dukakis on the Democratic side. It's it's, it's fun to draw. Okay, Matt Flynn is kind of strikes me as an old school politician. Even though he's not he's not the oldest person running, is he? He's not. I think he's 70. But his ideas might seem the oldest. Soglin is inching above 70. So Matt Flynn used to run the Democratic Party. Uh, he seems kind of like a throwback to me. One thing he stresses is he was a Navy guy. So, you know, you'd be, he's got sort of the military thing going for him. Which has worked for some Democrats. Yeah. He touts UW funding. His father was a professor, so I think he's wired into university issues particularly. He talked about, for example, reversing the where uh, Governor Walker watered down tenure protections for university professors. He's making that an issue that he would reverse that. That's an issue that plays really well outside of Madison, doesn't it? <laughs> Not really, but in a Democratic primary it might. He doesn't seem that exciting to me. It's interesting that a couple of minor candidates who have dropped out of the race have thrown their weight behind him. He's not a Madison guy, and you and I are Madison guys. I Honestly, I don't think I'd ever heard of him before this, even though he had been the head of the Democratic Party way back then. Mm -hmm. He just doesn't seem very exciting. He doesn't seem like he's the fighter, and um, I don't think he can compete with Tony Evers in terms of name recognition and, and sort of positive tone, so I'm not sure where he goes. I'd be surprised if his campaign takes off. Yeah, me too. Um, moving down the list to uh, after F comes what letter again? G. G, that's Andy Gronick. Oh! Andy Gronick is the <clears throat> business person from southeastern Wisconsin. Not a politician. Not a politician, and that's really how he's trying to distinguish himself. He says he's the outsider in the race. Didn't we just elect an outsider president? How's that working out for everybody? <laughs> I do have to say, though, that uh, I was a little impressed with Andy Gronick at the La Follette debate. He had a very likable persona and yet very, let's get to the point, let's not monkey around, let's fix things. He's bit really got that kind of friendly businessman, if, if that's not an oxymoron, Phil, to the left, vibe going. I think he could face some issues if he gets through a primary. He's had some ethical problems in Milwaukee where he was sued by one of his former companies for uh, working, uh, for taking pay without working. And he's had a lot of legal issues that could come back to bite him. But I guess on the other side, our president's had a lot of legal issues that had that never bit him on the way to his election. So Yeah, but he seems to be an outlier on that. He seems to be able to, Trump seems to be able to do anything. And I'm not sure Andy Gronick is a Democratic version of Trump. It just seems like there's, you know, worry about, you know, now that we've elected a businessman to the highest office in the land, I sort of wonder about how much uh, business people work uh, in, in government. Another candidate who's running, Mike McCabe. This guy is definitely a fighter, if that's what the Democrats are looking for. He claims that he's an independent. Well, and he did work for a Republican lawmaker way back in the day at the state capitol, which at some point in this election, I can't imagine that if, if he gets far that somebody won't hit him over the head with a flyer on that, that that you know he he's already worked for the other side so why would we trust him it seems like on the republican side they're starting to have a lot of tolerance for people who used to be democrats yeah um but on the left i'm not so sure that they'll forgive somebody for once being a republican but i'm not sure mike mccabe's ever i mean as long as i've been in madison which is a, which is close to 12 or 13 years i've never seen him have anything that was not a progressive thought come out or, or statement come out of his mouth I think he's sort of the Bernie Sanders of the Democratic Wisconsin gubernatorial primary. He talks about things in kind of these, you know, sweeping ways about ending vouchers, living wage for everyone, debt-free um, college. And, and he really wants to get um, the, the money out of politics. He spent a long time working on, on campaign finance issues at the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign. And that seems to be a big topic. And I think that, that resonates with a lot of people. Uh, you know, everybody agrees we have too much, you know, money in our politics right he definitely, now. Yeah, he definitely is running a grassroots campaign, and he's in some way limiting his contributions. And there is an element on the left that really, really likes him. But I think the Democratic Party is not going to wrap their arms around him. Well, you know, he, he still has said, I mean, he has not— He's the one candidate, I think, of the nine who has said he will not 
promise to endorse the Democratic candidate, yeah. maybe leaving the door open that if he does not get the nomination, he might run as an independent. And back when he was running the democracy campaign, most of the politicians didn't like him. He did sometimes go after the Democrats, too. There is a neighborhood in North Madison that really likes him because when I ran the marathon last year in November, we went through this neighborhood that was up past Troy Drive, and it seemed like every house had a McCabe uh, yard sign in, in either the window or on the yard. So that was that was bizarre. I mean, the one thing is you're not going to need a lot of votes to win if there's truly going to be nine people on the ballot or even, say, six or seven by the, by the time we get to that. Um, so if you in this race, if you can sort of peel off a considerable chunk of the Democratic electorate, you, you got a shot. But I still say his associations with Republicans in the past are going to kill his campaign. It seems like we're getting a lot of letters, maybe more than anybody else, uh, supporting McCabe. It would be interesting if he doesn't win, if he did decide to go independent, because you would then have Democrats painting him as a Ralph Nader who's going to ruin it for mm-hmm. him. Uh, moving on to Malin Mitchell, uh, he is the fire. He's a firefighter here in Madison. He also is the head of the state union of firefighters. I believe he's the only person of color running in this election, too. Uh, interesting uh, footnote: He went to the same high school as Governor Walker. He went to Delavan High School. Oh, really? Yeah, he joked about that a little bit, saying that obviously he had taken some different classes than the governor when he was there. Um, but he, he didn't take Union Busting 101? <laughs> no, he took Union Building 101. Oh. Uh, you know, he really is, I think, the union candidate. He's the only union leader currently who's in the field, I believe. Yeah. He's and gonna... he talks about my brothers and sisters in the union. And he's also going to be able to, you know, there there were a lot of votes in Milwaukee County that did not show up to vote in 2016. Maybe the implication was that a lot of African Americans in Milwaukee County weren't excited about Hillary Clinton, and he would be a more exciting candidate. Not that all African Americans have to vote for you know other African Americans, but that would be he could he could figure out how to bridge that gap between the minority base of the Democratic Party and the union base. And unlike the other candidates we've discussed so far, he's not super old. No, in fact, he's around 40. He and Kelda Roy's are kind of the two young up-and-comer candidates that are absolutely not baby boomers. No. Which maybe it's time to move beyond the baby boom. Yeah, we'll see, though. It, the the reality is that, that most people voting, though, are older. But I, I, I liked him when I saw him at the debate. I don't know him that well. I've only met him a couple times, and he was real upbeat and likable. His voice is low, kind of like Obama, and it just booms. And and Scott Walker does not have that same voice. No, and he did have a sort of a youthful uh, energy and vibe going for him. He's also pushing, I think this is another sort of a union issue uh, when it comes to, say, road building unions. He really pushed the road issue and that we need mm. to do something about that. And that's an issue that kind of bridges the political divide. Everybody agrees that our roads are not in great shape in Wisconsin. Uh, Kelda Roy's is running. Kelda Roy's is a uh, went to high school in Madison. She uh, went to law school. She is one of only two women, I believe, of the big nine uh, who are running in this race. And she also just had a little baby. It is a incredibly cute baby. It could be in a Gerber ad, and she seems to be taking it with her lots of places to stress that she's a young mother. She made national news by by actually breastfeeding her daughter on a campaign video, um, and it may be the first time that's ever happened in this country. One knock against her is she ran for Congress against Mark Pocan here in the 2nd Congressional District and just got creamed. Lost miserably. I think she tried to, you know, say she was the, you know, the, the candidate of LGBT rights, and Mark Pocan has been a member of the LGBT community for, and, a, and an advocate for that community for decades in in Madison. So that's kind of a hard sell. But again, when you're trying to carve out a more narrow group of voters in a crowded Democratic primary, if you're one of only two women running, you're a young woman, you used to be ahead, you used to be the leader of the um, pro-choice group in Wisconsin fighting for women's health and abortion rights. And she was a state lawmaker for a long time who was elected in the in the Madison area, and she's stressing issues like early childhood learning and child care. She wants universal paid leave. She definitely sticks out as, 
in the pack as something a little bit different from the rest. She could be formidable, too. I mean, she she could be one of those candidates that really inspires especially young women to get out there and vote. And, you know, that could be a, a demographic that would swing heavily for Democrats this year. Moving right along to Paul Soglin. This, Ooh, Soggy this, Paul. No, Soggy P. <laughs> You once uh, drew him in a cartoon as a rapper. I'm Soggy P, and I'm here to say I want to promote hip-hop in a safe and responsible way. Yeah, you know, i got to say one thing about Soglin is he does have a thick skin, uh, particularly when it comes to your cartoons. You do lampoon him uh, fairly frequently, and he has a good sense of humor about it. He's... uh, uh, been around forever, mayor, mayor for life. Mayor for life. Uh, Governor Walker immediately hit him when he said he was going to run. Uh, Governor Walker hit him with the uh, giving the key to the city to Fidel Castro decades ago. I think a lot of Republicans are sort of hoping it'll be Paul Soglin who wins the nomination. I think they feel like Scott Walker could defeat him. I'm not sure that's true or the case, but I think I'm not, I'm not sure a lot of people on the right are scared of him. I think you're right about that. I think they look forward to really bashing him uh, as as pure Madison. Uh, the one thing that Sagan does well that I think has excited some people on the left is he is a fighter. He's really good at that jabbing back. Like when Sh- Sean Duffy, or the governor for that matter, have made kind of digs on Madison in the last year, he's really come back with some sharp points about how Madison is – you know, really the engine of the state right now in terms of the economy. And the other thing he talks about is a sense of place, that Madison's a place where uh, people want to live, particularly young people, and that he wants to do more to improve Wisconsin's image so that more people want to, particularly young people, want to stay in Wisconsin. And I think Paul Sogan probably knows how government works better than anybody else in this election, maybe including Scott Walker. He knows a lot about the ins and outs of budgeting and government. He's done it for a long time. He's not always the most exciting person to talk, to talk about those issues. Yeah, he, he has a tendency to lecture. Uh, which, clear, which on the stump doesn't really work. But it's clear he knows a lot. Uh, another candidate is uh, Kathleen Weinhout, state senator from, I believe it's Alma? Alma, yeah. In western Wisconsin, up in the bluffs by uh, La Crosse there. We've got a few. We've gotten quite a few letters in support of her from from readers in our in our area. Um, she's run before for for governor. She ran during the recall election, lost pretty badly in the primary. Um and and I think there's a, there's a pocket of liberals who really like her and feel like she's the, the kind of candidate we need. She's not from Madison. She's a rural yeah. person. Uh, she's been a farmer and a professor and a professor. Um, the she's gotten some you know some people on the left will will knock her because she's shot a gun before and she's gotten <laughs> donations from the NRA before um, or, or contributions from the NRA and she's uh, not. Solidly pro-choice, I would say, uh, at least by the estimate of most Democratic voters. Yeah, she's not unthinkingly (laughs) pro-choice. Yeah. She's a little more moderate on some things. I mean, I think the one thing that's great about her, I would say she probably is uh, among, if not the sort of most analytical and smartest people in this race. She probably knows more about state government than just about anybody in the race. She may be the only person other than uh, Senator Luther Olson who understands inside and out the school funding formula. Which Which nobody understands. Nobody understands it's other than maybe those two people and our K-12 reporter, uh, Karen (laughs) Rivetall. Other than those three people, nobody understands it. But I think the two knocks against her are not a lot of pizzazz. And two, she's run before and didn't even come close to winning. And a lot of times you get dismissed if you run again after that. I will say, too, I believe, you know, she's in a Senate district in northern Wisconsin, and I know at least one of the assembly districts within her district is is a Republican district. So she does represent Republicans, and I think she wins her Senate seat on a pretty regular basis. You know, she made a really good point at the debate, I thought, at La Follette High School, where she said that the consultants for the campaigns tell them that they need to focus on the 3 or 4% in the middle. And I think she's talking about the general election here against the Republican. And she said where she can make a difference is by uh, appealing to the 30 or 40% of people who only vote sporadically. And mm. I think she's talking about the Trump voters, yeah. that, that she's got an inroad to those rural Trump voters 
that the other candidates in this field don't have. But how many of them are going to vote in a Democratic primary? Yeah, I don't know. Um, They're not going to vote for Soglin. The final uh, candidate who's big, uh, at least on our technically here on our sheet of the nine big Democratic candidates, some of them uh, people don't know. But I did air quotes around big there, Scott. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, Dana Walks, a uh, lawyer uh, from Eau Claire. He's also a state uh, representative. All I know is he should never wear a top hat because he kind of looks like the Monopoly man a little bit. <laughs> does he have a mustache? He does have a mustache. So there yeah. are at least two people in this race that have mustaches. That's got to be his exciting must- for a cartoonist. His mustache is not as good as Paul Soglin's. It, uh-huh. it is not the, the, the powerful Soglin mustache. It's kind of a weak, wimpy mustache. You know, Eau Claire's be, is this sort of place outside of Madison and Milwaukee that is becoming very exciting it, for young people to live. It's getting a bit of a national buzz. Yeah. And he's saying, I, you know, I'm different. I'm not Milwaukee and Madison, but I'm still progressive values, and I'm an attorney who can fight for people. But I would also put him into kind of the camp of not terribly exciting as a candidate. He's gotten a bunch of endorsements from, from establishment Democrats. Didn't Dave Obie endorse Dave Obie endorsed him, which isn't that surprising because he's sort of in that same kind of, a, uh, you know, northern – rural Wisconsin kind of a uh, uh, place there. But I think there's some weight behind that. Um, and I also think that that walks uh, – the other thing about him, kind of a knock on him, is that he, you know, his biggest fundraiser or his biggest you know, campaign funder is himself right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's given himself a lot of money. A, l- a lot of times what that means, they don't actually expect to spend their money. What they're doing is they're getting money out there to use now that they expect and hope will be backfilled by donors once they get some uh, – Momentum. If I was Dana Walks, I wouldn't hold my breath. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the final, uh, that's it. The big nine that's we got nine. through. But we have a whoa, bulletin. Bulletin this week. Tom Barrett, who ran for governor three times in the past. Uh, the first time was way back in something like 2002. He ran against... Um, Doyle and Kathleen Falk and lost in the Democratic primary. But then he did run against Governor Scott Walker back in 2010. And lost. And again in the recall. And lost. And again this fall. He's considering it. (laughs) I wanted to see if you'd say and lost again. (laughs) Uh, I don't think he's going to run. I think he's happy being mayor of Milwaukee for life. And <laughs> he's the second mayor for life. You know, I think he's tired. Of, you know, I think he's tired of losing these elections on a, on a statewide level. I, I just don't see there's any. The field's already crowded. There's too many people in there. I don't see him adding to it. Yeah, and I think Democrats are tired of him losing elections. I still go back to this race is Scott Walker versus Donald Trump. I think if it's a solid Democrat, the the race becomes. Is this a blue, it's it's the anti-Trump blue wave versus Scott Walker and who wins? Well, and I think I, the blue wave is is there's a lot to do with turnout in that in that case. We had very low turnout in 2016 because voters were not excited about Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. If turnout is high, it's going to be a good thing for the Democratic candidate. And and turnout will not necessarily be high because because people are excited about the Democratic candidate. Turnout could be very high because people are angry at Donald Trump. So, Phil, who do you really want to draw, though, in this race for governor? Who who would be the most fun to caricature on the Democratic side? Well, as much as I've enjoyed, you know, Paul Soglin is fun to draw, but his demeanor is so kind of like, ugh, and, and, and sour that he's not, he's, not, he's, not, he's not that great. Maybe I'll do Matt Flynn's hair. I mean, I could just have the hair run for, I mean, we could just do the character that's just the hair, just the hair. I think yeah. that says enough right there. I mean, I could do um, kindly old grandfather ears. You could have Matt Flynn wearing a Packers helmet. That would be, that would increase his popularity dramatically, <laughs> I think. And all the candidates are pro-pot, of course. Well, we'll see you next week.